As you know, advanced manufacturing technologies present issues and challenges as we will hear today. But the radical changes in possibility thanks to new technologies such as 3D printing present valuable opportunities for the U.S. to bring manufacturing back to the U.S. According to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, uh, a report to the President on capturing domestic competitive advantage in advanced manufacturing, advanced manufacturing is not limited to emerging technologies. Rather, it is composed of efficient, productive, highly integrated, tightly controlled processes across a spectrum of globally competitive U.S. manufacturers and suppliers. For advanced manufacturing to accelerate and thrive in the U.S., it will require the active participation of communities, educators, workers, and businesses, as well as federal, state, and local governments. Thanks to the breadth of the industries in attendance today, this symposium provides one of those needed uh, discussions. Before I get into the conference, there were two initiatives that I wanted to talk about that are sort of close to home here. Uh, the first is the Commonwealth Center uh, for Advanced Manufacturing, one of our co-hosts, uh, called, called CCAM. CCAM is an implied research center recently created by several Commonwealth universities and industries that bridges the gap between fundamental research uh, typically performed at university and product development routinely performed by companies. CCAM's goal is to accelerate the transition of research innovation from the laboratory to commercial uh, use. CCAM is the only collaboration of its kind in North America and it promises its member companies significant business benefits by pooling resources to pursue university research authorized by member companies, CCAM increases the value uh, of the R&D dollar. R&D risk and cost are shared by members away from live production floors and research results are shared with all members allowing each company to capitalize on new breakthrough developments that emerge from CCAM. The second initiative is the Laboratory School for Advanced Manufacturing. The University of Virginia School of Engineering and the Curry School of Education have collaborate, co collaborated with the Charlesville and Almont County Public Schools to establish the first U.S. Laboratory School for Advanced Manufacturing, backed by a $300,000 planning gift from the Office of the Governor. The first lab school was dedicated in September 2013 in Buford Middle School. Others are being installed in Jack Jewett Middle School, Charles Hill High School and Al Mall High School. The labs will, linked, will be linked to each other and to UVA via a via, uh, via, uh, video conferencing system. Whereas there are a number of schools of engineering or schools of education who are undertaking significant endeavors, UVA is the only activity that truly is a partnership between the schools of education and the school of engineering. Again, welcome to the symposium, and I hope that you will find this afternoon to be very informative. Now let me introduce uh, Dr. Dan Moat, President of the National Academy of Engineering, who will give you a few welcome, welcoming remarks. Dr. Moat. Well, Jim, thank you very much. It's my great pleasure to kind of represent the National Academy of Engineering uh, in this regional conference. And I will say Jim was absolutely correct. The National Academy did set the date here and gave him the responsibility to take care of the weather, however. <laughs> um, the, uh, the National Academy of Engineering um, was actually created under a charter for the National Academy of Sciences in 1863 when Abraham Lincoln wanted to get uh, advice for government from the expertise of the country. And he created the National Academy of Sciences uh, in, in 1863 uh, the, to provide this advice and ensure that the Academy of Sciences was not funded directly by government. So the, these are independent organizations. National Research Council was created in 1916, National Academy of Engineering in 1964. This is the 50-year anniversary of the NAE. And then Institute of Medicine in the, you know, 1970. So the National Academy of Engineering's responsibility is to provide advice principally to government. 85% of the efforts go through the National Research Council to, to provide advice for government on various, various topics. 
that the government normally asks about. But we also create a few ideas of our own that we want to give advice on as well. So the Academy is, uh, is a uh, kind of member organization. It, it elects its own members. And there's about 2,000 uh, members in the United States and about uh, 200 uh, foreign members of the Academy as well. In fact, Bill Wolf, who was a UVA professor, was 12 years, 11 years as the president of the NAE a couple of presidencies ago, did an absolutely great job, just really turned the Academy on in, a, in a very, very positive direction. And there are member, many distinguished Academy members at UVA and, of course, at Virginia Tech. And uh, so I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to come here uh, to talk a little bit about the Academy, but also tell you a little bit about these regional conferences. This is what we call a regional conference of the National Academy. And we call on people like Jim, say, Jim, how about it on you know, March the 25th in the snowstorm, 2014, would you do this? And he said, yes. Um, and there are actually five regional conferences a year in different parts of the country. And th the reason for having these regional conferences is to bring the academy out to, uh, to the members, but also to the local communities around the me members, industry and students and everybody that's around that wants to come. You have public symposia like this. And they're, they're very important uh, for the people locally, but also important for the academy to, to, make this, uh, to make this reach out and to understand what people are concerned about and what they're thinking about as well. It's a, it's a, it's a tremendous thing. So I thank uh, UVA and I thank Virginia Tech and especially everybody here that has put so much effort in to putting this program together. It's so, uh, it's so important for us. The manufacturing topic is clearly a critical topic. You know, when you say manufacturing to most people in the country, their, their image is large assembly lines with thousands of workers uh, m making things in an assembly line circumstance. And therefore, they, when they think of bringing manufacturing back to the United States, their image is bringing back assembly lines and bringing back thousands of jobs from, from places overseas. Okay? So that is, I'm sure you'll hear about today, not, not anywhere close to true. Uh, really talking about manufacturing in a much more holistic sense, in a much more complicated sense, a much more integrated sense, where the value is, is actually much, going to be much, much greater. But there will not be these thousands of jobs created in this process. I'm sure you'll hear that as well. So the, the whole idea of manufacturing now is looking at the overall value proposition for manufacturing, uh, not just the making the widgets in long assembly lines. And, and so it's a different concept for the country. And I'm sure this is an, a very exciting uh, Revolutionary time for, for the United States and other countries that are also going to be engaged in this process. So, so this is an extremely timely topic. I, I was very, very thrilled that, that we're having this topic. And I understand this is also kind of a, a, a monumental week for this topic as well. So I look forward to that. So the Academy sends its very best wishes uh, to uh, the, the conference and to UVA for putting this conference together and, and co-hosting with Virginia Tech. And, and I thank, thank Joe, I thank you very much in advance for your talk you're going to give, and the speakers of the panels as well. So th thank you very much. We really appreciate you to be able to do this. Well, it's now my honor and privilege to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joe Salvo. Uh, he has had, I asked him to give him a bio, and I need more material, Joe. You can tell him about all the good things you've done. But it gave me a little bit of insight, and that is that he's been 28 years with GE. Uh, he's now director of the Industrial Internet uh, at GE Global Research. Uh, and he, is, he and his team have built a wide variety of global data networks coupled with computer decision engines. So, Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that uh, when I started at GE some 28 years ago, the first two individuals I worked with, uh, Dr. Charles Bean, member of the National Academy of Sciences, and Dr. Ivor Gaver, uh, Nobel laureate uh, in superconducting tunneling. Uh, at that time, uh, Charlie Bean uh, used to tell me about the GE initiative in uh, weather modification. It seems like we haven't quite uh, mastered that. I'm going to go back and say there's still a little work to be done there. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction today. It's an honor for me to be here. Uh, I was uh, recently in uh, Washington, D.C., and I'd uh, 
hope to show you this brief uh, video. Now, uh, today I am joined by researchers who invent some of the most advanced metals on the planet, designers who are modeling prototypes in the digital cloud, folks from the Pentagon who help to support their work. Uh, basically, I'm here to announce that we're building Iron Man. <laughs> I'm going to blast off in a second. We've been, this has been a secret project we've been working on for a long time. Uh, <laughs> not really. Maybe. It's classified. So what I'm going to uh, talk to you about today <clears throat> touches on uh, a lot of the topics that uh, were mentioned in the introduction. We're really setting out to change the manufacturing paradigm. We're using some of the modern technologies uh, that have come from the software industry, uh, things like crowdsourcing, uh, things like 3D printing, and uh, the latest uh, is the concept of an industrial internet. And I'm going to try to set the stage of uh, why these things are happening now, uh, what the potential impact could be, uh, and uh, why there's huge opportunities for anybody who embraces this change. So uh, let's go on with uh, no further ado. So a little background, GE Global Research. Uh, we are one of the few uh, major central research and development labs left. Uh, we specialize in market-focused research. Uh, we have laboratories all around the world. Uh, one of our attempts to uh, connect some of the smartest people on the planet together to deliver innovation and innovative products. We've been in this for a long time. Thomas Edison, uh, our founder, uh, created uh, some of the best commercially available light bulbs uh, in his time. Uh, we have continued that tradition right through wind turbines, uh, electric vehicle chargers, and one of our latest innovations is a, a sodium-based battery where we built an actual new manufacturing facility in upstate New York. Uh, so the good news is manufacturing is coming back uh, to the United States, uh, and I believe for good reason. Now, one of the driving uh, forces has been a result of globalization and all the different changes that that fact has uh, driven. Materials uh, rising uh, across the board, production in many cases over capacity in all types of manufactured goods, and labor costs are increasing even in the traditional low-cost uh, countries. A direct result of this is the demand uh, to come up with innovative uh, products and services is greater and greater, and the product cycle has to be uh, shortened. So we have to really rethink how we do industrial R&D. Uh, in the past, it was pretty much a linear operation. You would try to start with a very innovative design. Then you would look to materials. Uh, better yet, if they were innovative materials, but materials take a long time to develop. Uh, then you would go and try to manufacture it and assemble your supply chain. This takes a long time under the best conditions. When you're thinking about complex cyber physical systems, the time gets longer and, and beyond the time you can afford to wait. So the new paradigm, which has really uh, been poking its head into this reality over the last five or ten years, is that we have to try to coordinate some of these activities in parallel, and there has to be overlaps. We have to move to a more non-sequential process. We have to create natural interactions between the groups of expertise, and we have to create new degrees of freedom to come up with this innovation. So one of the areas that I'd like to talk to you about today uh, is the ability to collaborate in virtual space 
uh, through the use of a crowdsourcing platform. And this can carry you from ideation all the way to the physical manufacturing process. So once again, GE is a global company. We have tens of thousands of engineers. Uh, hopefully more will become uh, members of the National Academy in the near future. Uh, thousands of tools and models uh, that they have to use to design these uh, innovative products that I'm talking about. And in the process, we're creating literally petabytes of uh, data. And this expertise, the information, the data, it's globally distributed. So it's a very uh, challenging problem. Now, one of the basic uh, lessons learned from the software explosion in the last 20 years has been a phenomenon called Metcalf, Metcalf's Law. So Bob Metcalf, uh, viewed as the inventor of the Ethernet, noticed that the value of these computer networks tended to increase as a power function of the number of objects in that network. So when you were building an ethernet uh, that may have personal computers and printers and fax machines, the value did not scale linearly. It actually went up in this curve, upward curve. So uh, the challenge when one is trying to build a community or a network is to try to get to the inflection point where it curves above the cost to actually build a network. Most of the companies that we associate with the Web 2.0 philosophy have taken good advantage of this effect by building very large, diverse communities, in many cases on a global stage. And other features that are associated with this kind of paradigm is there is a co-creation between the people in the community. There's a democratization of tools, of resources, and there is a commoditization culture that drives things to open source and open standards. Now, these issues, these opportunities, and these problems have been well recognized in the military as well. Uh, they had a very large program called Adaptive Vehicle Make. Uh, this is a program from DARPA uh, that my group was part of. And they had noticed that the time to create new uh, fighting platforms was escalating to the point where it could be 240 months from the time of conception to the actual delivery of the platform. Now imagine the change in software and computing resources over 20 years time. Obviously, a lot of that material that was stated the art at the beginning of the project is now obsoleted. So this is just not uh, tolerable and needed to tap into the global knowledge base and have all the direct connections to try to reduce the time and the cost to deliver these complex cyber physical systems. And in the process, uh, we hope to help democratize the entire workflow and increase the number of participants that could be part of these types of projects by orders of magnitude. Now, when we think of Henry Ford and his contributions to modern manufacturing methods, we often think of the assembly line. Uh, many, many people lined up with the work flowing by. But another way to think about one of the uh, big breakthroughs was that he took a very complicated system and broke it down into component tasks that almost anyone could master. What that did was it opened up the workforce by orders of magnitude. Anyone could participate in building these very complicated machines. And as a result, the costs and the availability went way up. So everyone could have a car if they worked uh, in this fashion. And it really changed the face of transportation, and it changed uh, the industry. So this interest in collaboration platforms, uh, as I go from group to group, uh, is, is a well-known fact now. And I've been to a couple events down at the White House. Uh, this particular one that I mentioned here, uh, ICME, is about materials, excellence, 
And it turns out uh, everybody is now agreeing that we need different types of infrastructure. We need to collaborate more. We need to have some automation in the case of verification and validation. And that this is all extremely important for our ability to compete and even for national security. So uh, this particular workshop that was uh, hosted by NIST at the White House uh, put together a very large uh, review at the end. And my group went through. And we found that at the different scale uh, material size, so they had a macro scale, a micro scale, nano scale, what were the key things at that scale that materials people needed to do that they couldn't currently do? They needed data and model integration. They ne needed what is called data federation, which I'll explain shortly. They needed to know where the data came from, how it connected, and they needed to handle massive amounts of data that continues to build. So the change of the manufacturing paradigm is going from isolated expertise in the design and modeling, simulation, manufacture, to a more integrated knowledge environment. And we need to be able to find the information quickly in a searchable way. We need to automate a lot of the workflows that are typically manual today, where a designer does his work in one place, manually ships it either by email or a snail mail package. That has to all be automated. Automation is one of the key features of this. So as part of the Adaptive Vehicle Make program, uh, we built the beginnings of a platform at GE. Uh, it allows you to quickly share, find uh, both data and models that may be useful to you to build the next jet engine or the next car or the next computer. Uh, it allows you to have a single source for all your model data and your services. And it gives the average person the ability to get access to tools that normally they would never be able to get to. Automated CAD uh, software, testing facilities, wind tunnel, uh, co advanced computing facilities. So it really changes the game. Now, one of the key aspects when you ask people to share, uh, you want to make sure that they feel there's an incentive and that they'll be compensated in a just way. So uh, the concept of federation uh, comes to bear here. So here we allow people to actually keep their models or their data at their location if they so desire. So there isn't one master data warehouse that sits somewhere and you have to trust them to keep everything secure. You can actually keep your data, your models, your know-how uh, with you, but you can still use this environment to automatically connect different models to your models, et cetera. Uh, if you do not have any models but you have know-how, you can still engage with the system and access all the features that people put out there. And it is a true marketplace, so the owner of the intellectual property uh, can determine what fee or other compensation is required to access his information. The benefit of data uh, federation is that it allows a central governance where the access to the models and the data is controlled from a central location but the data and the models actually reside locally with the owner if they choose to do so. Once the permission is given to an individual to access it, he can access that information controlled by the owners for the time period of the project. And then once the project is finished, that access disappears, as does the access to the data. At a high level, uh, the platform is built like any other modern uh, software platform. Uh, it has a distributed service uh, marketplace where people can come and buy, share, sell things. Uh, it has a project collaboration space, things like wikis, which allow people to post information, uh, data sets, drawings, uh, anything they choose. And rather than a sea of emails going back between individuals, all the communications are organized by the project. 
The GE Forge that we created was actually the first commercial uh, use of Amazon's GovCloud. Why this is important is this allows people to use ITAR uh, compliant uh, system to do export controlled work. Uh, it has all the security uh, features that are required to do that. And it allows you to not have to buy all the computing hardware uh, and have it on site. You can actually uh, use a cloud service and just uh, pay for what you uh, want to use. One of the uh, comments that always comes up is, well, I'd love to do it, but I just have too much data and I can't move it around uh, easy enough to do this. So as part of the testing, uh, we actually transferred almost two terabytes of data across the country for less than $30 in 30 minutes. So trust me, if you're building a jet engine, a $27 bill for data transfer is not going to stop you from uh, the design path. So this is a very, very uh, easy to use, uh, uh, economical way to approach the, the challenge. So in the end, we have a uh, production-ready service marketplace ready to take on the challenges of modern design. But I want to give you some specific examples of, okay, that sounds good in theory, but what do you actually do in practice? So uh, the reason uh, I showed the clip of President Obama was that uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was at the White House. Uh, where they announced the creation of a new uh, digital innovation institute that is going to be out in Chicago. Uh, GE is providing the core uh, digital uh, marketplace function for that, which I just described. Uh, this is going to be a real instantiation. Uh, so uh, I encourage any of you that are interested in learning more about it to uh, come and see me after. But here is exactly uh, what some of the features look like as of today. Uh, here's an example of when you enter the marketplace, it looks like a modern uh, web-based uh, application. You do not need any software to use this service. All you need is a browser. You could literally run this off your smartphone. Uh, there is a model hub where all kinds of models are available. There is a uh, social network area where you can look for people that you may want to work on the project with. You can identify them by various uh, meta information, their skills, past projects they've worked on. There's a simulation service, so if you need access to high performance computing resources, with a click of a button, you can use that resource. Now, we've seen that by infusing not just software, but modern manufacturing technology into our design paradigm, uh, we can often take out two to seven X of the materials uh, in the parts. Uh, we can also greatly improve the yield. And now we have even more tools. Additive manufacturing is one I'd like to talk about now that combined with this new environment, uh, we can start to experiment with totally different design uh, features. So we have the seamless integration now of our materials knowledge, and we're going to attach it through this marketplace to additive manufacturing, for example. In the past, most of these sophisticated components that we were putting into things like aircraft engines and power turbines were done through subtractive machining, where up to 95% of the materials that started in the part forging would be cut away and left on the shop floor. Today, we are uh, very, very uh, interested in additive manufacturing, which starts just with powder or wire and builds up the material layer by layer uh, in almost a pixel fashion. Now, up till now, much of the interest has been in prototyping. And prototyping uh, is a very, very important feature of speeding up this whole uh, invention cycle. Uh, we have great interest in electron beam melting and direct metal laser sintering, two methods that you really have to master if you're going to make real metal parts 
and not the fun little plastic things that come out of the MakerBots, uh, which I really enjoy too, but they're not going to go into an aircraft engine anytime soon. So we did acquire a company that was a leader in this area, Mars Technologies, recently. And like I said, prototyping is very important, but it really is all about production. And GE Aviation recently has announced that they are committing to put uh, components that are additively manufactured uh, into the next generation LEAP engine, uh, 19 nozzles per engine. There is a uh, backlog of $68 billion of these engines. So this is uh, not a let's try it and hope it works out. This is a real commitment. And uh, we have already tested the engine on September 4th, and uh, it is uh, meeting everybody's expectations. So this is a huge opportunity to inject the most modern technologies into some of the most complex uh, physical systems on the planet. Now, once again, we're experimenting with bringing new minds to the challenge. We had a crowdsourcing event that uh, recently selected some finalists. There's an aircraft engine bracket shown up in the right corner. We asked people to try to redesign the bracket and see what they would come up with. And the winner actually took up close to 85% of the material out of the original bracket design while maintaining the physical properties that were required in the spec. So uh, this has really convinced us that there is a huge opportunity to engage more people in the process. Uh, and in order to do that, you need the platforms that I talked about in the beginning. So as a result, uh, we now have the beginning elements of what I would like to call cloud manufacturing. It's a collaborative, distributed environment that allows for material innovation, design, modeling, simulation, verification, validation, uh, production. And uh, we have already begun to look at crowdsourcing uh, to take advantage of this. But can we do even better? And once again, going back to the software paradigm, uh, it turns out that the architecture uh, that you build into a software network or a manufacturing network uh, is critical in uh, what kind of results you get out. So you can think of architecture as just the process of how to take a complex system and decompose it. Architecture is really on the same level as law and uh, personal preferences. It constrains behaviors, it constrains activities, and in many cases we don't think enough about it ahead of time. But if you look at what happened in the uh, commercial consumer internet, the way that was laid out is the organization was very modular. Uh, it had layers of standards and uh, it also allowed the applications that existed at the ends of the infrastructure, the software programs, to really evolve freely and not be constrained by requiring the infrastructure to change every time a new application was created. This allowed an explosion of new software products and services to evolve because the infrastructure was stable and standardized. So modularity, layering of the stacks so that you did not have to understand all the different standards and technologies that were below you. The application just had to interface with the stack below it. And then this end-to-end -end principle that the applications at the end rule supreme, these were incredibly powerful concepts that we should uh, learn from when we're trying to build an industrial internet. Now, what other criteria uh, other than performance uh, allow constraints to arise? Well, in much of today's internet, data is transferred as packets. And it's on a best efforts basis. Now, if your life depends on this packet being transferred, I think best efforts is not quite good enough. You want guarantees. 
And you also want guarantees, and not just on delivery, but you want to know that the bandwidth you need is there when you need it, and the time of arrival of that information is also going to be guaranteed. Now, you can do some of that today, but it's very costly, very expensive, and we think for the industrial internet, we're going to have to have some better approaches to accomplish that. So in the industrial internet, where we want to connect industrial equipment, things like locomotives, healthcare equipment, power systems, we need a real serious network that is going to be secure, robust, resilient, and have things like modularity, layering, end-to-end -end argument, but also guaranteed timing when you need it, guaranteed bandwidth, and identity. And you've seen just recently in the press discussions about the pluses and minuses of net neutrality, where uh, Netflix was having problems getting their content delivered in a timely fashion, and it resulted in different side deals being uh, done to ensure that that occurred. Uh, that is the problem when you need guarantees that things go through. Uh, we do not think uh, that uh, it, it should be difficult to accomplish. So if you look at the new businesses that have sprung out of the software explosion over the last 20 years, in many cases the business models are as important as the actual technologies themselves. Uh, they have created distributed ecosystems around them. They often work with their customers. They're collaborative. They're democratizing. And we want to get a lot of those features into this industrial internet as well. Now, I would say that this is really the beginning of one age, which I call the systems age, uh, and the end of another age, which I would call the information age, which sounds odd in that I'm talking about how these machines are going to continue to create massive amounts of information. But like any age, uh, the winners are the ones that can master the latest technology. And I believe the latest technology is mastering how to design and operate very complicated systems, including manufacturing systems. So as the intelligent machines begin to uh, deliver this information via an industrial internet, our traditional methods of storing the data and processing it are really going to be overwhelmed. The, uh, the rate of information production is exponential. Uh, we need real-time decisions in many cases uh, from these machines. And in many cases, the actual value of the individual data is approaching zero, the average value. There is some valuable data out there, but it's surrounded by data that has little or no value. So finding that data uh, is an enormous challenge, and I know some of the new uh, data science efforts here at UVA are targeted at uh, helping solve that problem. So I want to just close with some uh, observations uh, that other people have made as well as I've uh, recognized, is if you extend what's going on in the computing science field, uh, where we have Moore's Law that is showing that computing power is doubling approximately every 18 months or less. That trend is uh, expected to continue for at least another few decades. Uh, if we understand the value of Metcalfe's Law, where the value of these collaborative networks goes up exponentially, the question begs, when does the machine start to challenge average human cognition. Ray Kurzweil, who's a uh, futurist, uh, has written a book about this topic and has plotted out the average uh, cognitive capability of various living things and compared it to uh, available computing power. Uh, he has suggested that in as little time as 2020, there could be a physical uh, piece of computing hardware that would have at least the computing power to perform the number of calculations. Makes no comment about the ability to program this hardware. That could be you know, a, a daunting task. It obviously will be. But the concept is the, the cell phone has basically become a supercomputer uh, just in a small amount of time. 
Uh, the memory that I purchased when I was a graduate student a thousand, uh, for $1,000 uh, was only 10 megabytes. You can now buy a two or three terabyte hard drive for $79 from one of the big box retailers. In those dollars, that would be basically $100 million worth of memory. So I've lived to see that exponential scale uh, in reality. So now project another 20 or 30 years out, what is this going to be able to do? And we've seen some very, very early attempts with interfaces like Siri uh, and a couple others that I'll talk about. But even if you don't believe that uh, Moore's Law will continue, there are other architectures that are being looked at today. The Synapse program, once again, uh, sponsored by DARPA, has some other technologies that should carry computing uh, beyond the Moore's Law limits. So if we take this to its logical conclusion, uh, we can say that commoditization of almost all physical asset classes occurred last century. This century, we're going to see the continued explosion of digital content uh, that will change the perceived value of any data and will uh, change the way we interact with information. And as a result, we are going to see the evolution of what I believe will be fuzzy memories that will not remember every exact detail, but will be able to recognize patterns that are important and valuable in the blink of an eye, just like our brains do today. So in some sense, there'll be a form of machine consciousness, not necessarily human consciousness, but the ability to learn, uh, to have some level of self-awareness that will be viewed as a valuable thing to do. Uh, Remember that the value of networks has been exhaustively proven. Things like Facebook, Tencent, it's not a US-centric phenomena. It's in Russia, it's in China. Every organized uh, population has noted this phenomena. We have seen that education is becoming more and more collaborative. The top research institutions in the country are now sharing their uh, educational syllabi. Khan Academy is teaching anybody who wants to learn calculus. <laughs> you can go online and, and get some fantastic information. And the next step is the commoditization and the distribution of knowledge. Watson from IBM's labs uh, beat the best uh, Jeopardy contestants uh, that have ever been seen. It was an amazing feat. So. Next up, we're going to have these collaborating machines. Uh, they're already out there. Uh, I would ask you, how many friends does your computer have? Seems like an odd question, but think about it. Every night, it's looking for software updates. If you have a computer that a business purchased for you or a university, chances are there's software that's checking on what you're doing and reporting back somewhere to somebody or some other machine. So in many cases, your computer has dozens of friends, some of which you know about and that you have authorized to make decisions on your behalf, like update my browser whenever a new update occurs. Don't even ask me anymore. I just want the new version. Update those little add-ons. Don't bother me with that detail. Uh, it's not in the far distant future where they will be negotiating for you too. And that's where I get a lot of blank stares. But remember how the financial industry works on Wall Street and all the machine trading. So it's really already here. I encourage you to look at Boston Dynamics site on YouTube if you haven't seen the rise of the machines. Uh, some people find them very interesting. Some people find them a little scary, but nonetheless, they're already here. So I would say we are now in the throes of the next industrial revolution. Like most revolutions, some people wish it would never come. Others can't wait for it to arrive. Uh, I think this one is going to be powered by innovation 
additive manufacturing will certainly be a big part of it, and the machines are going to become more and more brilliant. So if you would like to join uh, with me and GE to explore this new uh, revolutionary territory, uh, I would encourage you to contact me at a very simple email address because I was there before email existed. So with that, I'd like to close. Thank you very much. Well, I didn't mean to uh, exclude NASA from the party here. Uh, we work with NASA all the time. They're a great partner of ours. Uh, they uh, are definitely interested in cloud uh, technology. Uh, they are exploring a lot of the things that I talked about, additive manufacturing, uh, intelligent robots. So uh, they are a big player in this space. They want to be. Um, so. Uh, just an oversight on my part not to have them up on the screen. For people who want to ask questions, there's a microphone uh, in front of every other speech. Just press the button on the green light comes on and now everyone can hear the question. Joe, just one question on yes. uh, when people are thinking about manufacturing, they, they, they do think about jobs for <coughs> Americans. Mm -hmm. In fact, mostly not the high techy jobs, but the jobs for <coughs> Americans generally. But I didn't hear you mention that, that, that issue. What, what, do you have any um, thoughts about the extent to which uh, there's going to be a big job explosion uh, for uh, the jobs that have been lost during this recession that are going to come because of this? direction you're pointing out. Yeah, so it, it's always hard to look at a crystal ball and answer a question like that. But I can say that last time I looked, Schenectady is in the United States. I live there, and there's 500 new jobs there with that battery facility. Uh, that was a greenfield uh, plant. They built it from scratch. It wasn't put into an existing facility. Uh, that has very uh, large growth targets, so we expect that to grow. Uh, the batteries are used for distributed power for uh, wind turbine systems, et cetera. Uh, the other part that I don't think has been fully appreciated is that when you separate manufacturing from design, you lose a lot of the iterative cycle between those groups, and you lose the ability to create the next generation products. And that has been fully recognized, I think, across uh, most manufacturers today. And that is another reason that people are bringing manufacturing back to the country, not just because of a cost uh, reason, but because uh, the inability to innovate when you separate these, those two functions. So even though we're going to be able to continue uh, driving the best ideas from around the world, I think you will have to have design and manufacturing co-located in many cases, and that should directly result in new jobs. Uh, thanks, Joe. I thought your presentation was very good. Um, so you, you said something about having a secure internet for the industrial internet. And I was wondering, in the absence of that security and assured access to information, what kind of threats do you perceive that would threaten this model? Yeah, so I, I'm not an expert uh, in security. I don't pretend to be one. I think this is a problem that can't be handled by any one person or institution. Uh, we have to address this as a community. 
uh, and a global community at that. So uh, we need to assemble the best minds and, and tackle this issue. Uh, there are certainly things that have to be secure. Uh, the question is at what cost and what inconvenience. Uh, I think there are solutions out there, uh, but it will take a community uh, to solve that problem. So if anyone would like to continue that dialogue, uh, we certainly have people engaged in it, but the answer is not going to come from one company or one group or uh, probably not even one government. Uh, I kind of have a question about manufacturing um, compared to software development. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the big trends in software development right now, I guess, is like agile development where you have small yes. iterations with each version. Uh, how would that really work in kind of a manufacturing situation where you're building a physical thing and you have to support it after it's been constructed and uh, the, act, the yeah, so the, the complications that arise when you're actually making a physical object. Yeah. So that's a fantastic question. Uh, we are moving more and more towards agile manufacturing concepts, but I think you hit the nail on the head. If you start to create many, many different variations, uh, how do you support and make sure that they're all going to perform? So one of the things that we're putting a lot of effort in is to be able to create models that are fully, uh, uh, you can put them into simulation and do the experiments in a computer simulation versus every build, you run it through the paces. And the auto industry went through the same phenomena where they would crash test 500 uh, cars to make sure that the design uh, was crash worthy. But as computing simulation improved and their models improved, uh, they only have to crash five cars now to verify what they've already proved to themselves in computing software. So we're moving in that same direction. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, these are very, very complicated models and compilated simulations. But if I were a student just starting out, these are some of the areas that we are going to need some really bright people and phenomenal uh, architectures and phenomenal hardware uh, to test so that we can do a lot of the experimentation in the virtual world. And that will allow us to uh, do custom manufacturing, short runs, uh, short redesign cycles. Yes? Sorry. <laughs> Could you differentiate for us um, the difference and, and the circumstances under which uh, you use your internal federated network and when you actually use the worldwide crowdsourcing to solve a problem? Yeah, so uh, GE has many divisions uh, that span from making light bulbs home appliances to nuclear power, wind turbines, et cetera. Uh, they have many, many different processes, and in many cases they make their own decisions on what the best approach is. Sometimes it's not even clear. They, they have to try things as well. Uh, I think when there is a truly uh, differentiable feature on a competitive basis, that tends to be kept internal so it can be protected. Uh, but other than that, um, I think we're looking for the best ideas from where they can come from. Thank you, uh, Dr. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it.